Hello animals, I'm Fox Espresso and we're gonna be traveling to Cannes a different way. All aboard animals. Trains aren't really all that common in the United States, and even less so in Canada. But that makes them a very unique and potentially fun way to go to a convention. For the sake of the series and video, I'll be talking about the two remaining staples of rail, Amtrak and mostly Amtrak. Sorry Via, you're just not good enough for this. For most of you, odds of taking a train to a con are very slim. Amtrak serves cities once a day and at odd hours, and are often subject to mutual delays. It's all a complicated historical mess as to how we got into this sad state, but long story short, Americans fell in love with cars in the 50s and plane tickets became a lot cheaper in the 70s, that train companies soon couldn't make money carrying people. So Amtrak came to be in order to run a bare-bones system and prevent the U.S. from losing passenger rail forever. It still serves a purpose, but the ability to use it as a legitimate alternative to driving or flying are few and far between. For the most part, you don't take Amtrak to go somewhere unless you're Amish, it's their only mode out of town, or it's either part of your vacation or the whole point of your vacation. So there are places where the train is a legitimate way to go. In fact, that's kind of why I'm on one right now. In select parts of the US, there are Amtrak routes that have multiple trips daily and are a good alternative to a car. For instance, if you live in California Central Valley, you can take Amtrak's frequent simulcane and capital order trains to further confusion. Midwest Furfest, with a connection on CCA's Blue Line, can be accessed from St. Louis four times a day on the weekend service and from Milwaukee on the Hiawatha with six to seven trains a day. Amplewood Northwest, located in downtown Seattle, is easy to get to from Portland four times a day and Vancouver, uh, Canada, twice a day by the Cascades. Last but not least, the Northeast United States has its golden gem. From Boston to Washington, D.C., there's the Northeast Corridor 55 regional, Northeast regional trains a day run through the main entirety, which combined with eight daily Acela Express trains, 16 Keystone trains that branch out to Philly, and a wide variety of regional commuter trains make this line the heaviest served in the US with 2200 daily trains. Combine that with 10 daily Empire trains to Albany, New York, and five daily trains to Maine on the Down Easter. If you're in the area, you'd have no issue attending Vacation Land, Abbey, New England, for Apocalypse, Philadelphia, and furthermore, in Portland, Maine, Boston, Stamford, Connecticut, Philly, and DC, respectively. Taking these corridor trains doesn't really require much thought. Just book at the time you wish and go. However, not all of them are made equally. Uh, much like the U.S. itself. In terms of on-time reliability, it goes from the Northeast services, then downhill from there. More on this later. For pricing, only the Pacific Surfliner, Capital Corridor, and Hiawatha have flat rate pricing, meaning that you can book as close to 5 minutes before departure and pay the same price as someone who booked months in advance. All other trains are priced on demand, so book early. However, for most of you, as I've mentioned before, the train is more of a once-a-day thing that appears at all times and it takes forever. Welcome to the world of long-distance American Rail, guys. Long-distance trains are a time capsule to a bygone era where a journey would often take days to get between places, but you'd do so in reasonable comfort riding aboard various cars of steel with grand names like the Southwest Chief, Empire Builder, Silver Meteor, and the Coast Starlight. While they do provide an essential service in small towns across the country, for the most part, the experience is more of a land cruise and the journey is part of the fun. 
Never expect to get in a long distance Amtrak and get to the destination quickly and on time. Others have covered Amtrak setbacks in their history a lot more than I could explain. For those interested, I'll link to the relevant videos below in the description. For the sake of this video, let's focus more on what to expect on a journey, how to best prepare, and when to burp. So for these long distance routes, you have two options, coach or sleeper. Riding coach is basic, but you'll have a lot more room than a bus or a plane. The plush sheets recline, come with leg rest, power outlets, and plenty of room to sprawl. If you're hungry, you can buy food in the cafe car. The quality is very much convenient store food at a captain of audience prices. For a day long journey, the trip can be pretty cozy. Just disconnect from the world and let the scenery roll by. If you're doing an overnight trip, the seats are good enough to sleep in, but just be sure to bring a light blanket, pillows, and eye masks. If you're on a budget and want to experience the train, riding in coach can be a good deal. Now, if you have the cash to burn and want a more classic experience, then splurge for a sleeper car. While it is, well, it can be 10 times the cost, you get the added comforts of a dining car with three hot meals a day, a shower, lounge access in select stations, and most importantly, a private room with two seats that convert into a bunk bed. Rather, you have three sleeping options on board. On the cheaper side is a roomette, which can technically sleep two people, but is about the size of two coach seats and is rather snug. But it does offer you much needed privacy. On the higher end is the bedroom, which can sleep three people and comes with your own private bathroom. Roomette guests will need to use a lower level shower. For those with difficulty walking, accessible rooms are also available. And if you have large bags, it's best to either check them or place them in a storage area by the doors as none of the rooms have ample storage space, especially the roomettes. I've done the sleeper once and it's an unforgettable experience I highly recommend if you can afford to do it. There's also a business class option on some routes, however what Amtrak considers business class varies widely and there's no easy way to describe which one is worth an upgrade. Now that we got that covered, you may have noticed with this uh, assorted B footage that there are both single and double decker options. Which one you'll end up riding on will largely depend on where you're going. For the most part, routes east of the Mississippi that start or end in New York City or Boston will be a single level with a sleeper and dining cars known as viewliners, which have a window for the top bunk. Hooray! Everything else will likely be a double darker on what is known as superliners, which will have a the classic Sightseer Lounge. As of this writing, dining on the trains east of the Mississippi is more of a TV dinner and is rather limited and kind of bad in quality compared to the superliner trains or trains west of the Mississippi. So please, manage your expectations accordingly. So, you somehow have enough time off to take the train. What do you need to do? As I've mentioned before, it really depends, but here are some tips to keep in mind. Number one, pack a lot of patience. Save for one stretch of track in the Northeast Corridor, Amtrak runs on freight-owned railroads. The latter of which has higher priority, despite a law that states otherwise. Because of this, you are likely to get stuck for hours until that extra long freight train passes you. So please don't plan anything time sensitive for the day of arrival. The only exceptions to this are, of course, any routes within the Northeast Corridor which is wholly owned by Amtrak, and for some reason, California ran lines like the Capitol Corridor, San Joaquin, and Pacific Surfliner, which themselves seem to have priority over both freight and long distance Amtrak trains. Number two, be prepared to disconnect. Save for the aforementioned corridors, which do offer Wi-Fi, expect no signal or connection for large stretches of track. How on earth are you going to fill your time? Well, you can look out the window and let your mind wander while you pass through majestic nature and charming small towns. Or if for some reason that bores you, you can just download music, movies, or bring a book or two prior to your trip. If you're the creative type, train travel can provide inspiration to draw or write. Number three, pack your own bites. If you're on the train for more than a few hours, you will get the munchies and relying on a cafe car can get expensive 
and if it's a busy train, ran out of fuel until the next extended stop. Also, if you're in a sleeper, you will get hungry between meal times and the cafe car isn't included in your ticket. I know, it's a shame. So if you want to save some cash and maybe have something healthier than a microwave ball hamburger, then pack some of your own snacks or shelf-stable foods. Number four, pack a power strip or a power bank. And coach, there's one outlet per seat, which is nice, but they're both by the wall, which makes things awkward if you have a stranger in the window seat. In roommates, you only have one power outlet. So it's very much a good idea to bring a mini power strip to ensure juice gets to all your devices. Number five, dress comfortably. You'll be on board for several hours, likely sitting down, so be sure you're in something that's cozy enough for you to relax in. Also, bring a change of clothes and light toiletries with you in an easily accessible bag. This is especially important in coach, where all we have is a recliner chair and no shower. Number six, take advantage of extended stops. Every so often, Amtrak will stop for 15 to 20 minutes to allow for a refreshment of supplies crew switching, refueling, and most importantly, getting fresh air. This is an opportunity for you to get out and stretch your legs. Just uh, don't wander too far from the train. It will leave without you. Number seven, advocate for better rail service. American rail travel has the potential to be better. While advocating on a national level is tricky, you have more power to make an impact on a state or and regional level. If your state or region doesn't have frequent rail service or reliable rail service, speak up. Contact your local or state representatives, your d Department of Transportation, or equivalent. Attend meetings and be able to voice your opinion. Every one person can help. And now we approach the end of the line. Have you taken a train in North America? Leave a comment below sharing your experiences. This video wrap wraps up all about travel to cons. Next up, we'll go over probably the most important part of doing a furry con, which is dealing with the hotel. If you like this, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe. And if you wish to support more videos like this, don't hesitate to join the Fox Perso Coffee Club. Until next time, see you around.